Hey everyone, this is Nick Murray. Welcome to Trailer Sound. We've got an amazing episode for you today. Uh, we're joined by a very talented trailer music composer. Um, before we bring him on camera though, I would like to um, uh, talk about our sponsor this week. We just have Switch Trailer Music. Um, new album called Dark Matter is out now. Check out switchtrailermusic.com. Um, so a little bit about our composer this week. His name is Alexander Dmitrievich. Um, just recently, um, I think this year alone, he's got stuff on trailers for Epic, Iron Man 3, After Earth, The Place Beyond the Pines, Star Trek Into Darkness, Warm Bodies, and on his Facebook page says, for the last four years, he has been working with Immediate Music and wrote tracks that have been featured in over 30 trailers for some of the biggest movies in the last few years, including War of the Worlds, The Incredible Hulk, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, Terminator Salvation, and many others. 30 trailers, that's insane. You guys are in for a big treat today. This is Alexander Dmitrievich. How's it going, Alexander? Oh, yeah, I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so Alexander, um, first of all, tell us where you're joining us from and uh, how you ended up there. Uh, I'm joining you from Oslo, Norway. Um, originally, I was born and bred in uh, Serbia, but I came to Norway to work as a sound designer in, I think, 2000. So I've been here for like 13 years and um, I just kind of stay. I mean, I worked as a sound designer, you know, built my career as a composer, got into trailers and here I am. Wow. So, uh... Is your Norwegian pretty much fluent by now? I'm guessing after that long. No, no, it isn't. No? <laughs> actually. It's not at all. Oh, well, <laughs> that's what you get for sitting in a studio all day. <laughs> that's especially what you get for sitting in a studio all day and working with mostly American and English clowns. Oh. So, you know. Well, that's what you get. <laughs> Well, well yeah. that's cool. So this is your studio here. Um, we'll get a little, we have a studio tour video of your studio. We'll take a look at a little later on in the show. Um, so you've been there about 12 or 13 years, started as a sound designer. Um, was that more mm -hmm. in like fully sound design for movies and stuff? Or was it kind of musical well, sound design like we do in trailer music? Or what, what was that like? Well, really, it was, uh, it was a game company. Okay. So, um... It was a sound design for games, and I was kind of leading the whole audio department pretty much. But but it was very varied. I mean, it started out like a usual fully sound design stuff that you do for the games. But then, because I worked on that job for maybe four years, um, it ended up being a lot more from uh, overdub recordings, recording with the actors, even crazy stuff like mocap sessions and uh, a lot of interesting things. But basically, I was doing that during the day and during the night. I was composing and learning orchestration and you know working on my craft. So, and that that, that was actually somewhere until 2004, 2005, and then I kind of stumbled onto trailer music and thought like, hey, maybe I should try doing this. And uh, the the first thing that I sent was to Immediate Music, and uh, that went well. So pretty much after the demos and and uh, getting in touch with um, Jeffrey Feynman and Neil Goren. Um, I was recording like two tracks in Abbey Road on their second Teams for Orchestra and Choir in 2005. And uh, those two tracks did really, really well, and uh, which kind of gave me uh, courage to, to quit my job and sort of try this for, uh, for a career move. So. 2005, so I guess eight years, uh, it worked, so it, it worked quite well. So yeah, the, the, the stuff on my Facebook is actually shamefully uh, outdated. I mean, that was some years ago, so it's a bit more trailers, but more importantly, it's been eight years, not four years. So, so let's let's multiply that. If that was four years and I've done it for four more years, I'm guessing that number is at least doubled. So yeah. That's amazing. Um, so your entry into trailer music was with Immediate. Um, back then, how many composers, outside composers, were they working with besides Jeffrey and Yoav? Do you know, were you kind of the first guy to come on board or? 
Not really. I, I think they they were working with uh, with quite a lot of uh, guys on and off, um, and and I think they were always open for getting the material from other composers. And uh, so, but but they were also very, as they are now, very picky about not really the composers, but the material. You know, that's the that's the other thing. It, it's not about you know in general what you can do and how you compose it's it's really about the track you know whether you can deliver or not so um yeah and and i i think they, they still sort of uh, always look for for new people and always look for good material so yeah do you, but uh, do you know i know we have a lot of um young composers who watch the show and and people who are trying to get into this field um do they do you think they still well, I don't know. We we we've talked to a couple other composers who have written for them as well. You know, Chris Haig has had some success with them. We've met with him before. Um, do they kind of have their core team of guys, you and Chris, and a couple other people, and then themselves now, or do do people do they take submissions from people still? Well, do you kind of know how that works? Uh, or? Yeah, I, I'm not really sure how they operate because it's it's kind of their thing. I know that I can recommend somebody to them, and I do, you know, like at Bradshaw and, and some other guys. I mean, if I if I stumble on a track that I really really like or or a composer that I think that really really works, I will you know pick that up. And next time I talk to you or Jeff, so I'll check say, out you know, this guy. Check yeah. this guy. Yeah. So if the track works, they will they will work with them, and I think even Chris and everybody else sort of got their foot in the door that way. I, I think that you know if if you send them a track, uh, it might happen that they're really busy, you know, and they won't listen to it for for you know a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months. But the thing is that if, if the track is good, uh, they will still sort of you know go back. I, I know that because I see that on every release, they're still new composers, you know, that they never worked before. So it's really about the material. Um, if, if you have the material, you can work for immediate. That's at least how I say it, although I, I don't run immediate. So. Yeah, <laughs> you don't want to speak for them. But um, yeah. that's, you know, it's good advice it, that the the music comes first, of course, if the music is something that, that they're going to make money off of because they think it's an amazing cue or amazing track, then, you know, of course, they're going to yeah. want it. Um, so let's take it back. You said uh, you were writing music in the evenings after your, your your day job. Do you have a background in composing, or was this kind of something that you started off doing sound design and then it, you know you wanted to figure out how to use these tools to, to make music and went that route, or do you have more of a trained compositional background and a degree in orchestration and that whole that whole side of things? No, I, I don't. I'm completely self-taught. I mean, I was sort of on and off in music from a very early age, you know, from plonking on a keyboard when I was little to picking up guitar when I was 14, you know, and then going through bands through my teenage years. And and I guess it was always music was around in a big, big part of my life. But uh, I guess in my 20s, I, I started to sort of maybe be you know started to be daring enough that they think that hey maybe i can try this you know maybe i can learn by myself uh the other thing is that the, you know the computers and, and the studios were sort of starting to be more realistic you know with the giga studio appearing in what like 98 you know 99 and uh you know the first sealage examples in vitus and 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 um so i i just wanted to to see if i can if i can learn and to do that myself of course at that time the the primary focus was i would love to do you know games and i would love to eventually you know work on 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 big movies you know and uh learn how to do scores so uh, i guess it just started like that like for everybody else so that period like me moving here you know and uh, learning in the, those five and even before that six years was just have a lot of studying and um, classical stuff, you know, from from just orchestration and, and learning how to do that, which paid off because my first gig for trailers again was, you know, uh, teams for orchestra and choir too. So it, it was it was kind of intimidating to be there. You know, the first session that I did was with the you know 82 piece orchestra. So it, it kind of paid off that uh, I was sort of delusionally preparing myself for that you know it, it kind of uh, seems unrealistic when you're doing it you know for 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 some years but um, it, it, i guess what i'm trying to say is that 
you know, learning new stuff all the time is, is a very good investment. You might not know it now, you know, but in five years, it, it could be just the right thing that you need. Do you feel that that is something that that still happens for you? Do you do you learn new stuff every day or do you kind of feel like, you know what, I got this down. I understand trailer music. I know what's going to be successful. It's just a breeze. Or are there still things that you're like, oh, my gosh, I never knew that. Or, wow, that's that's interesting. You know, all the time. I mean, for me, if I if I don't have anything new to learn or experiment with, it's dead. I I, I can't do it anymore because, I mean, th there are certain things after you know eight years and and what like seventy trailers. Of course, there are things that I feel confident with, but <clears throat> those are things that are more uh, connected to a lot of experience and a lot of trailers being watched first of all every day. And they are connected to uh, the structure of the trailer, learning more about how the editors think, mm -hmm. uh, being quick to pick up what is the trend that's actually, you know, uh, in demand right now with the, first of all, the, the, the movie houses and then the trailer houses. So those are the things that I'm probably more confident now than I used to be. But in terms of the, the music itself, no, it, it's... It's still about what new can I do in this, you know, very precisely set box that, that, that's a trailer track. So you have to think that it's a box. You have to know that it, it serves a purpose and, and you have to get sort of that down. And, and when you do that, yeah, th then it's always about learning. Right. Not to mention that writing for an orchestra, you know, I mean, hopefully I'll be learning, you know, as, as long as I'm alive, as every composer should be, because... You know, if you're writing for a, for a, for a full symphonic orchestra and you think that you got it down, uh, you really don't know much. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's there's simply too much to learn, too much to to understand, experiment. So, yeah, but that's that's the fun part. Of it. Right, of course. Um, so, uh, how does your sound design background come into play with that concept? With you know, when you're standing in front of a 100-piece orchestra, or, you know, 70 to 100-piece orchestra, or when you're writing for that kind of music, um, do you approach that from your sound design background at all? Does that play into to, to this, or is this, are you wearing two different hats? Am I doing, a, are you doing a sound design cue one time and then orchestral cue, or is it all kind of the same process for you? Uh, honestly... I do tend to sort of see it as a, as a completely different process. Uh, in the beginning, especially 2005 and let's say until 2008, when when kind of the pure orchestral big epic thing, you know, was uh, still going on. Uh, of course, I was writing with with the uh, with the recording session in mind, you know, and then certain effects that you want to get, you try to get through good orchestration rather than, you know, uh, amplified with, with sound design simply because it sounds better live. But if I'm doing a lot of hybrid things as I'm doing now for the last two, three years, I consciously don't do that because I think if you have a very strong sound design, if you have really sort of big synths and if you're working with a lot of sub frequencies as I'm doing right now, then orchestra is playing a certain part, but let's be honest, not an essential part in the terms of the live players, you know, and maybe a soloist, you know, maybe depends again on a track. But uh, yeah, I, I guess you could you could you could say that it's two different hats, and also because I have so much fun with sound design, I love programming since I'm always up to hearing distortions and, and compressors. And once you start doing that, honestly, composing for orchestra is important in terms of harmony in the team and stuff. But, you know, um, how it sounds and, and how it pumps, you know, it's it's kind of more important. And, and plus you get lost, you know, in, in tweaking everything for, you know, a whole day. Right. So it, I guess it's two different things. Right. Um, well, I want to take a listen here so some people can hear what we're talking about. Um, Let's play, uh, how about the After Earth trailer? Um, that one's got your uh, your cue in it called Sublunar. And this is from, mm -hmm. uh, what what release is this from, from Immediate? Uh, Violations. Violations, okay. So we'll go ahead and play the After Earth trailer and Alexander's cue in this is called Sublunar. 
All right, Alexander, we're back here now. Nice job, man. Congratulations. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk about when you approach a cue from a sound design per perspective, um, now that we know it is a different process for you, do you start with kind of an overall sonic theme in mind? Do you place yourself in a world where, okay, I'm going to use you know, kind of ambient synths and kind of create this atmosphere? Or do you just kind of start messing around with stuff and whatever sounds cool? Or do you say pull up a trailer and mute it and kind of compose to it? How do you approach a sound design project if sound design is so, you know, so original or so out there? How do you know what sonic elements you're going for? All right, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, I, I rarely compose to to a muted trailer anymore uh, for several reasons, but that's a different topic. So um, when I'm doing a, a cue of, of this kind, I, it usually starts with experimenting. Either I got the new synth or I got the new distortion or I'm a lot of the times it's just watching uh, you know, YouTube tutorial videos about, you know, dubstep or drum and bass and you see some sort of cool technique and you kind of start, okay, I want to learn that, so I'm going to do that. And in the process of doing that, you start getting something cool. Now, the trick is that that thing that appears is to know what is it, you know, is it strong enough to be a backbone of a trailer? Is that going to be my baseline? Is that just going to be a bass hit, you know, that's going to be every four bars? or it's going to be a sweep or it's going to be something else. So I, I guess deciding, you know, what that thing is going to be is, is, is a big, big process. And once I have that, I, I kind of decide, of course, in my head, what do I want the track to be? So at that point, I don't experiment anymore. I kind of sit and, 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 and think about it. You know, mm -hmm. if I want it to be a one minute cue, I want it to be a two minute cue. Do I want it to be, you know, intermiddle and the back end, or I just want it to be a back end and you know, it uh, depends B because the, the reason why I do that is that uh, we get lost as composers too too often, which is a wonderful thing. But, you know, if you're working on, on such a restricted form where you kind of have to say what you have to say and sort of still follow the structure in those 60 seconds or in best case 120 seconds, you don't want to get lost, you know, after, after you get the initial idea. So that's how I do it. And... Um, so yeah, I guess just deciding what that thing is going to be. Sometimes it's a baseline, sometimes it's just a, a, a sound, a, an ambient sound. And what you ask if I decide beforehand if it's going to be a strong cue or it's going to be ambient or not, I, I don't. I, I kind of let whatever I got in that first session, it kind of tells me what it wants to be, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess that's, that's how I do. And then, of course, you leave it to stay for... You know, a couple of days, you go back to it and see if it's any good, see if, it, you know, you should do something else, and, and that's that's about it. So, but I enjoy doing a lot of those. Violations has mostly cues of that type, and now I'm doing new material for Immediate, which is also very sort of uh, hybrid in nature and a lot of synthesizers, but, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I just love programming synthesizers and making weird sounds. It's nice. What are your go-to synths these days? Uh, well, there's a lot of things, but the, the staple is uh, Zebra Tool and uh, Native Instruments Razor. For some reason, those two I, I use all the time. Razor is not that popular compared to Massive, but but, but it's an amazing thing. Yeah. Uh, mostly because uh, it, it's so clean in the in the in the sub sub frequency area that it it really helps with the mix. You know, when when you have to get down that forty two hundred hertz area and to kind of really know what's going on there, it's 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 great. And zebra, of course, it's uh, yeah, I just love it. I mean, I can I can spend days in zebra. Really so. nice. I yeah. zebra is one that I never really got into because it's so ugly. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like yeah, it's got I, such yeah. a. It doesn't have a very easy to use um, user interface. Um, some of the yeah, other soft synths are kind of more approachable. So I'll have to go back and revisit that for sure. 
Yeah, don't, don't don't be afraid of it. I mean, it, it looks weird and it's strange, but the thing is that you can use Zebra as, as a very, very simple one oscillator synth, you know, if you do a, a template, uh, which is really easy to control, and it will still sound better, deeper, and cleaner than majority of the other ones. Cool. Zebra helps with the mix. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's like Hans is not usually wrong. Yeah, know? yeah, <laughs> that's excellent. Um, so... I know you've written a bunch for Immediate. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the other companies you've written for? Yeah, I, I wrote... Uh, well, I, I had one release, short release for uh, Fire Dirt Music some years ago. I can't even remember when. Mm -hmm. That was well. Uh, then in 2010 or 11, I think, I, I did quite a lot of uh, tracks. I got in touch with uh, Gabe Shadid from Epic Score. And um, I worked with him, and and that was really really good. Um, I enjoyed that quite a lot. I think we did fifty or sixty tracks. I think um, it was different. It was quite different than working for media, and it's a different company and it's a different target audience. So you you can write you know different kind of music with different sort of sets. Uh, so it, it's just very different things. Yeah. And I uh, I also had the, one of the releases on. On two steps, I think, um, through Extreme, but that was sort of. I think I started my own kind of library in 2008 or 9, and I just didn't have the time or patience to to run it, and it, you know, wasn't really working. And Thomas is a good friend, and then he said, "I really like this thing. We're gonna put it out." So they put it out. You know, that worked okay. But uh -huh. I, I think that's about it. Now, is Thomas from Norway too? <laughs> Yeah. So does he? Do you guys hang out up there at all, or is he? No, actually, we never met. Oh, okay. It's strange, like face to face. I mean, we know each other through chat and email and forums since '99, I think. Um, and that was really back in the day with uh, with the whole sort of mock-up thing and virtual orchestra starting. Mm -hmm. So that's how we started, and then. Uh, of course, we stayed in touch, and now he's in LA, and right. um, yeah, but we never met face to face. Okay. So, you know, I like how you say you would approach writing for different companies. You know, you can approach that differently. You can, you know, look at what yeah. what that company over here is kind of their market and what their aim is and what, you know, maybe the other ones are for. Um, so, oh, what was I going to say? I had a thought about that. Um, do... Do you ever? I don't remember what my thought was. Oh well. Um, do you get into TV libraries too? Do you do TV music or, or no? Uh, I, I try not to, not specifically, no. But the the thing is that Epic Score, by its nature, because it's uh, distributed by. Oh God! Now my brain stopped. <laughs> <Contained. laughs> hey, it happens. Yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, Epic Score has quite a lot of usage on uh, on on TV I mean internationally so by its nature that material ended up on on television much more than let's say stuff that I do for immediate and uh, I guess it's different market and different approach in in uh, how you present your library so. right right um, but I, I don't I don't write specifically for uh, TV libraries. No. Oh, I know what I was gonna say. So you also mentioned you know when you started writing for or when you wrote for Epic Score for that stuff, you wrote fifty to sixty tracks, and that's something I want to mention for our viewers who are getting into composing, who may uh, you know think they've written one or two or three or five or ten tracks. Um, you know, oftentimes I tell people write a track a day, you know, write a cue a day, you need to be writing all the time. Um, and I think yeah. that they think that that is because I'm telling them to practice, that, that it's like, you know, oh, you need to practice every day. When really, once you're, you know, get busy, you're, you're writing, you know, you're writing well over 100 cues a year, you know, you're, you're writing literally a few cues a week at least, um, and, and yeah. getting them out the door and on programs and whatever. Um, so I think, you know, if if you want to really get into the industry and stuff, you got to get used to writing fast, writing good and fast and put those two things together so that you can really start pumping out um, a lot of amazing product. Um, 
So I want to go. Yeah. Uh, anything? Anything you want to say about that? Or... No, just that I agree, and I think it's a good advice. I mean, the, the, the thing is that the the way the industry works, you could have one or two tracks, you know, and actually make a really good career if you're lucky. You know, I was when yeah. I started. But the thing is that to aim for that is really insane. The reality of it that even if you get lucky, you won't get lucky again, you know. And and then it comes what you're saying, and you really have to uh, uh, kind of make a lot. Uh, the, the only thing that I would add to everything that you said is also that once you start writing that much, it's I think equally important to know when to stop because you can't do it 12 months a year. Of course, you know it's. Um, you will you'll burn out and you know and you need to do it every year if you're doing this professionally so uh, I, I guess it's it's uh, very important to find that fine line which is very personal again you know for yourself it's uh, when when is it too much and uh, yeah not, do not, you, not to burn out because... do you overshoot the number of tracks on a certain project so say say immediate says hey we're doing this new album um, we've got you know three or four composers on or whatever we need you to do four cues for this album would you say write six to eight cues and submit those um, in case they you know throw out a couple of them or um, or no uh, it depends I mean um, the thing is that if I get into writing and and the cues are just sort of you know popping out I will write them I will finish them and if somebody ordered four and you know they don't want the other ones it, it doesn't matter you put it in your material you know it will be used sometime yeah, give it to someone else or, yeah exactly okay yeah I mean the thing is that if you're having a good cue finish it it doesn't matter if people don't like it it doesn't matter if it's not gonna go on the library right now again if you're doing this for on a long run you know uh, that shouldn't be the priority and and also if people you know it, it, I, I try to avoid writing ordered material uh, sometimes I have to it depends you know but I try to avoid it mostly because Mm, I get better material out if I can just do what I want right. and uh, even if that means that you know there's going to be 20 cues and out of that 20 cues there's going to be just three that they're going to do really well I'm still fine with that because you know in a trailer market if you have three cues that they're doing really well you're still doing really really good you know right. uh, so kind of like that I think so but then talk the, about general... talk about uh not getting emotionally attached to your music do you know what i mean by that um so say say if yeah, someone yeah. says you know hey that cue's not working for me or for this project yeah. or you know maybe they just don't like it maybe they don't like the sound design you used or the synth sound or something like that um it can people can get emotionally attached to that they can say hey you don't like my cue you know i spend hours on this thing or i know it's good and screw you or something like that Talk about that process. How do you not get emotionally attached to your music so that you can be confident about it or um, that side of things? It's it's difficult. It, it's really, really difficult. I don't think there's an easy way around it. I mean, of course, the more you do it, the more experience you get, you know, and the more you know how people function and the more you know yourself, you know. Uh, how will you react in a long time? Because, you know, one of the things is that, of course, every cue that you wrote, and that's the newest one and freshest one and that you like, you know, you think it's the best thing ever. And, uh, you know, but the thing is that down the line, two years away from that, you know, it, it might happen that you go back and, and you and you think, you know, the guy was right. You know, right. it's like I, I really should have done right. that. So, it, it, it's it's difficult. Uh, I remember that that when I started it, it, I was really bad at that actually because I mean you know there there, there was you know here you have Jeffrey Feynman and you have Goren you know and telling me sort of suggesting what I should do you know with the back end and I never did a trailer in my life and we're going to Abbey Road you know in in a week <laughs> and you know I'm on the phone and I'm kind of like I don't like that you know it's right. like like I think what I did is really really good you know so. I guess you have to, maybe the best advice is, 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 is to try to balance who are you talking to and compare, compare your own experience to the experience of the person that you're talking to. Because emotionally and personally, it's never going to feel good, no matter how experienced you are. It's always going to feel, you know, awkward. But the, the thing is that that's, I guess, the only guide that you can have. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And the other thing is that ultimately, it's a very easy choice. I mean, if you're 
presenting a queue to somebody who hold, you know owns the library and wants to release it, it's their call in the end. The only sort of choice that you have is that either you will try to find a compromise and do you know what they want you to do, or you will say I'm not going to give you, you know, my own queue right. and then go and try to release your own library. Right. You know, it's like so. So without naming names, have you ever been, had a queue rejected by one guy and said, you know what, I still really like it, submit it somewhere else, and then it it works or they they take it? Does that happen? Yeah. Okay. So, like I said, <laughs> don't name names, but you know that's that's good to know. So people, you know, if they if they submit something or or if they really stand behind their work, hang on to it. Maybe maybe you go back a couple years, like you said, and maybe the guy was right, but maybe there was something in that cue. They're like, you know what, that actually has a little bit of a good melody right there, or something that you can work from and uh, and go from that as well. You know, exactly, and and try to get as varied opinions as you can you know and uh, especially with the people who have experience you know you, you might send it to one guy and he might say that you know you should do something else and uh, you might send it to a different guy and he'll actually see something good in it as you said so you know if, if you get three guys and all three of them say you know this this, this really sucks I mean, <laughs> get, 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 you get a hint yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know it's uh, but uh, yeah I, I definitely agree with that because it's not really about whether it's good or, or not. I mean, come on, let, let's be honest. I mean, on, on that level, you know, the level that you are and, and, and the actual libraries that are working, kind of the, the, the minimum requirements of quality that, that Composer needs to have is, is, is quite high, you know. So it, it really comes down to somebody's personal preference and uh, gut feeling that they have at the moment. So maybe you're right, maybe they're right, you know, but it, it, it doesn't matter in the end. If, if you want to release with them, it's, it's what they say. Right. And the only thing that you can say is that sort of, you know, I, I'm not going to do the changes. I'm taking back my cue and then you're going to see what you're going to do. With right. It, so. right. I mean, yeah. And you always have that choice. If you want to hang on to your stuff and release it as your own album on iTunes, by all means, you know, no one's stopping you. Exactly. I mean, I guess when I was, you know, younger, the, the situation that I can really recommend avoiding at any cost is sort of talking to people that want to work with you and sort of you get in a situation where you're telling them what they should do uh you know with with their company and their library you don't want to be there because it becomes ridiculous mm -hmm. you have the control over your own music you have the control over what you want to do you know by all means but that doesn't mean that you know better you know what what other people should do if you did why do you need them you know it's like right right so let's talk about a little bit, um, actually before I ask this question, I just want to say also that um, everyone who's watching the show, remember that we're live on Twitter at Trailer Sound, and if you're watching on Ustream here, you can also type in questions on the, it's called the social stream on the right hand side of the video. So go ahead and type in any questions on Ustream or at Twitter, um, and we'll make sure to ask Alexander here. So a uh, question I want to get into, Alexander, um, along the same topic is, in your experience over the past seven to eight years doing trailer music, how have you seen trailer music itself change or evolve? Um, you know, like, I'm guessing if you went and listened to some of your early stuff, you may, you may, uh, and I'm not, I'm just saying this from my own experience. When I listen to stuff that's even like six months old, I'm like, oh man, you know, I could do so much better. Um, how, you know, how is has your work and has trailer music in general progressed or evolved over the past seven or eight years since you've been in this space? Right. Well, honestly, as far as my work goes and how I see it, I, I don't get that much. I, I get quite the opposite, actually, a lot of the times. I go back to really old stuff and I think like, man, I could really write compared to today, <laughs> you know? I kind of always beat myself and it's like sort of, I forgot how to orchestrate, you know? <laughs> And uh, I remind myself, and, and of course, sometimes you have material that was kind of weak and, you know, I think like, what the hell was I thinking that week, you know, but uh, uh, I guess I, I, it just, it happens so much and it's so chaotic for me that I got used to it, you know, sometimes I, I might like it, sometimes I don't, so honestly, I, I don't pay attention to it anymore, it, it's always about what I'm doing now and uh, that's what I try to focus on, so. As far as the, the trailer music, it changed a lot, but I guess the 
the main difference is that there's 10 times more players, you know, offering music to the trailer houses now than in 2005. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, the editors and trailer houses have far, far uh, bigger uh, pool to choose music from, which makes it even more difficult to get placements. And as far as the styles go, I guess uh, I, I, the, the shortest way to answer that is that I think that I noticed that there's a very kind of circular thing going on, you know. Um, it uh, One thing becomes very popular and the other thing sort of gets out of the fashion and that lasts for a year or a year and a half, then the other thing comes back. It, it kind of really goes back and forth. And through that, some of the stuff is uh, progressing as well. So. Music, I think it goes in circles, you know, it, it used to be, let's say 2005 to 2008, uh, it was all about big epic orchestra, you know, the, the music stuff, the, the entrance of Thomas in two steps, you know, and their first releases and all of that. Then you had an interesting period of that 115 BPM halftime sort of big drum beat, slow guitars kind of thing that was done by... Um, yeah, yeah, Michael Nielsen, and, uh, I think they're Ninja Tracks mm -hmm. now. And um, then you had like a lot of the, you know, after Inception, of course, we, we started with the, you know, the, 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 the big broom tone. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it, it, I guess if, if you watch it every day, you know, you, you see some patterns going back. But right now, like a lot of the epic stuff is coming back as well, but it's kind of epic hybrid. You know, there's some dubstep there. Uh, I guess you, you, you know, it, it always kind of goes forward, but it goes backward as well. It's weird. It's it's really hard to, yeah. <laughs> hard to reinvent the wheel sometimes, too. Exactly. Um, okay, so let's, uh, I've got one question here from Fabian Mueller. Um, he has a question that is about, uh, let's see, kind of the licensing side. Um, if you're working for companies like Two Steps or Immediate, do you get paid once, kind of like an upfront payment, or is it, or if it's in use, back-end payment? Right. So without giving uh, numbers, well, maybe I, just talk about kind of the difference in, yeah. in companies like that. I can only talk about my experiences, and they can be varied depending on many things. But the usual thing is that you're splitting the so-called synchronization license uh, between the company who's publishing the track and, and between yourself. So that's kind of the, the main payment. It happens that you get uh, some amount in front if, if, the, if the material is ordered, you know, if, if, if the company sort of asks you to do. And it also differs whether that amount that's being paid beforehand is that your composing fee or it's going to be calculated as sort of a deduction from any sinks that you might generate, you know, with the material that you did. And as what he said, once or two times, well, with synchronizations, as many times as the trailer track is used in a trailer, that many times you get paid. And, and yeah. And how much varies a lot, uh, much more than, than people think. So, <laughs> well, that's always a good thing. Um, yeah. So, I want to go ahead and play uh, your quick uh, studio tour video here, so people can see um, where you work. Sound good? Yeah. Okay, here we go. This is Alexander's studio in Norway. Hello, this is Alexander Dimitrievich, and uh, this is my studio or my workspace. As you can see it's a really really simple setup. Um, not much to say really. At my desk I mean uh, you can see my speakers which are really old Behringer uh, truths. Um, the audio interface that I'm using right now is the Complete Audio 6. You can also see my uh, Pod X3 which I use for guitars, my Audio Technica headphones, and over here we have my uh, Yamaha uh, AN1X which uh, I use mostly, not mostly, exclusively as a MIDI input keyboard and on top of it uh, it's a Korg Monotribe which I love to use recently by the way 
and uh, over here are uh, my guitars and uh, that, that's pretty much it my guitars, my input keyboard, Korg Monotribe, Polex 3 headphones, speakers and my computer of course on a desk and uh, that's about it Alright Alexander, we're back with you here. Um, cool little setup. So you're a PC guy. Yeah. Um, and what, uh, I know some people get really nerdy about this stuff, but what kind of sequencing do you use? Cubase. Uh, Cubase full of plugins, full of samples. So I guess Cubase and uh, Contact, that's the, that's the setup. Uh -huh. Cool. And then our I don't know how much we're gonna get. You know, this is a topic that can last like yeah, we could twelve hours to two minutes. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to do twelve hours of that. Um, so the guitars that are behind you right now, um, are you are, are you playing guitar tracks on, on on your own stuff, or do you use it for demo purposes and then it's re-recorded? Um, you no, know, I, I I play it on everything, and actually even after Earth and and a lot of my material in the last let's say two years and pretty much everything on epic score everything is from this little room there's very little outside stuff so right. it's just in the box and what you see it's that's that's where it's done so yeah, i play the guitar bass and a uh, bit of keyboard that's that yeah all right so let's go a little bit into our quick fire round here we already talked about um a couple synths you like so um really quickly what is your go-to strings right now uh, that would be Albion 2 and uh, Adios uh, Adagio and uh, yeah, uh, LA uh, last, what's it called? LA scoring the, strings. LA scoring strings, yeah. I mean, that one is actually so much in my template that I forget about it. So it's more like LA scoring strings plus Albion 2 and plus Adio Adagio. Great, great. Um, brass. Brass, uh, pretty much uh, cine brass uh, since I got it like some six months ago. It replaced pretty much everything. So it's cine brass plus some custom samples that I, that I have. Right. Um, pianos. Pianos. Uh, yeah, I don't know what they're called. There's a really, really old one. And I'm also using the one from... Uh, you have to help me. One from uh, Sound Iron, the, the one that's uh, recorded in the big hall. Um, yeah. Like not the Thomas Newman one, but the other one. The Montclairion of... piano or something. That. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> oh man, I'm embarrassing myself now that I know that. Um, we talked about synth since. Um, actually, let me ask one question. Um, a lot of your kind of ambient synths. What's your go-to for ambient synth sounds like? Really, to create that, you know, not we're not talking about some dubstep baseline. Something that's really going to create right. a, like a trailer intro type sound. Honestly, I mean, if I have to pick the synth, it would be probably Omnisphere uh, for that kind of thing. But the truth is that in my work, uh, most of the times, that kind of thing that you hear uh, comes from a lot of experimenting, as in running things through very unusual uh, convolution impulses, experimenting a lot with the uh, reverbs. A lot of the time it's just a strange guitar noise and cool. stuff. So for those kind of things, it's not really the It's same. not one so patch or just like, zebra. bam. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. It, it might be zebra with the very basic sounds, but what it goes through is actually what makes it, for me, uh, in, into the ambient. Great. Thing. Great. Yeah, let, let that be a lesson to young composers as well, is that presets are a great place to start and then you know, go from that point. Well, it, I mean, it, it kind of, you know, just quickly in terms of presets, uh, at least for me, it kind of sucks like as, as, as great as the preset is, you know, if you kind of use it in the intro of your track and you think that it's awesome, then you go to the cinema and another trailer starts and it starts exactly yeah. like yours. Yeah. It, it's not going to feel good. <laughs> yeah, especially when that check doesn't come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, percussion. Oh, percussion, I'm crazy with percussion. Right now, just quickly, I think, uh, let's say Damage, uh, Thunder. What else am I using? The stuff from Albion 2, uh, True Strike 2. 
Mm. And, and a lot of weird stuff for electronic things. I mean, I, I, I get a lot of kind of cheap uh, electronic music sample libraries with strange things, and then I run that through a lot of strange things, as in, uh, I, I guess a lot of the, the stuff, there, there's a lot of things going on underneath, very quiet, so it might be damage and thunder, but there's a hell of a lot of things underneath that they're doing kind of the frequency things that are not in your face, but they're there. And, and those things come from strange sources. Cool. So Lots of strange stuff happening in that room. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, distortion. Distortion. Uh, Trash 2 from Isotope, then uh, Combinat 2 from Audio Damage, and... Uh, yeah, I think that that's the two culprits. That's Great. it. Um, okay, we got a couple more. Delay. Delay. Right now, I'm using uh, Waves Age Delay. Okay. Uh, reverb. Uh, Valhalla Room. Interesting. That's a new one for for and, the show. Also, Valhalla. Yeah, Valhalla Room is great, and and it's fifty bucks, and it's pretty much, you know. Uh, a thing that I use all the time for my strange stuff, <laughs> but also I use uh, I also use uh, a lot of the impulses from um, uh, from Peter Ro Ross from Peter Ross. Um, I think he did the the Bicasti M7 uh, impulse set, which is actually free, and and those are really great. So those I use quite a lot on orchestra when they need it. Yeah, I I love those impulses. You can find them on the internet. Yeah. I don't know personally how how they match up to the actual units. I haven't, you know, I don't have one of them, so I haven't been able to ABM, but the, the impulse responses sound great. Yeah, who cares? It sounds yeah. great. <laughs> exactly. Okay, um, last one. Uh, EQ. Let's say on uh, a female vocal. Um, I would say uh, Vuxango's uh, Gliss EQ. Uh, I use that one pretty much on everything. Okay. It's it's quite amazing and uh, extremely versatile. It goes from complicated things to basic EQ that's very, very clean. So I use that on everything. Great. Okay, last one, actually. Final, final one. Um, stereo bus. Stereo bus is master. Yeah. Um, I guess that would be... Actually, quite a lot of things. Uh, from Vuxango, I use uh, a low frequency punch. Uh, then um, the the thing that they call, I think, Sony Vox, or it's actually their multi band uh, multi band compressor. I use Glue as my master compressor, and then as limiter, I use either Ozone uh, from Isotope. Or sometimes I use uh, Voxango Elephant, depending on what you need. I think that's about it. <laughs> nice. Well, there you have it, folks. That's how he gets his strange noises. <laughs> so take good notes and uh, try to copy it. Good luck with that. Um, oh, we got one more question here. Choir. Choir. That's a good one. Choir, in, I used... Uh, the old uh, sound iron got my brain stopped. What's it called? The 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 one that uh, the requiem one. Yeah, requiem one. Requiem light actually. I'm using that one, and I'm using the new uh, from from uh, Thunder guys. What's it called? Thunder and I can't remember anything anymore. The storm. It's, it's from stress of sampling. Storm choir. Storm. Yeah. Storm yeah. choir. Yeah. So storm and requiem. Thank great, you. Great. Great. No. I got your back. Um, <laughs> well, guys, we're actually about out of time now. Um, went by pretty fast, but uh, hope you really enjoyed talking to Alexander. I know I did. Um, I would love to, you know, spend a few hours in the studio with him and watch how he gets this, you know, sound and and amazing success over the past seven or eight years. Um, we wish you great success in the future, Alexander. Would you like to um, thank anyone or any shout outs before we go here? Well, thank you so much. First of all, thank you for having me. And I would just like to say uh, a big thanks to, to Jörg Warren and uh, Jeffrey Feynman and uh, Ellie Wittaker at, uh, at Immediate Music for doing great job that they're doing. And also to Gabe Shade at Epic Score. So, you know, 
big thanks for those guys. I mean, it means a lot to have a really good team that takes care of your material. So great, thank you. And then, where can we find you online? Uh, website, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Uh, online, I guess the best place is just to uh, type in my name, Alexander Dimitrievich, on Facebook, and uh, my music page should uh, pop up. That's the thing that I update actually most uh, most frequently. So if you want to get in touch, that's the quickest, best way. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Alexander. Um, everyone, make sure to tune in next week, and we'll see you all later.